Hi, this is Mike Regan, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this informal, on-the-record interview. And I've uh, brought back a good friend and associate, Vic Stadahar, to share with you some insights about what's going on in the LTL market. Now, very briefly, one of the reasons we're doing this is because for the last couple of weeks, in our two-minute warnings, we've been talking about the LTL marketplace. And a couple of weeks ago, when the Journal of Commerce released their article about some comments that I made at the Inland Waterway Conference that they sponsored, I got a lot of responses from folks saying, Mike, can you give us some additional information? So one of the things that we do periodically around here is just get together and discuss what's going on in the market. And when I sat down with my friend here, Vic Stadahar, Vic gave me some great information that I said, Vic, we have to share this with our audience because it provides some valuable insights that they need to be aware of in things they can do when they conduct their next LTL sourcing event. So Vic, welcome to this On the Record here. Good morning, Mike. Uh, thanks for having me. I look forward to having a great discussion with you this morning about the LTL marketplace and what carriers are doing in today's marketplace and how it affects uh, our shippers on a day-to-day -day basis. Vic, let me just offer a scenario here and get your insights. Maybe you could give folks a, a little bit of background about who you are, your experience, and that type of thing. Well, I started in this industry a lot longer than I, I hope to remember, but uh, I started back in 1973 after I graduated from Northwestern with the International Harvester, spent uh, about 12 years there, and went to Sarah Lee Corporation, and I joined the Transact family in 1998 where I started uh, with the, the truckload program for our Freedom clients and then moved over to managing the Freedom business in uh, 2001 and uh, retired in 2014 from uh, my role as Vice President of Logistics here working for you and Gene and then uh, have come back periodically to, to share some of the wisdom I gained uh, over those 40 some years in the logis logistics field. One of the things we've been highlighting for our audience is that there have been some seismic changes in the LTL marketplace and it's had a significant difference on how carriers are making decisions that affect a shipper's rates. And that was reflected in the article. Maybe you could just touch on a couple of those things. Well, I think seismic was a, a great choice of words, Mike, because it really has been a, a real uh, meaningful difference in the way carriers are looking at the business that they're handling with shippers today. Um, it wasn't too many years ago where the carriers didn't have uh, sophisticated costing models. And I think it's fair to say that it, it, at a point in time, not too many years ago, that Shippers probably had a better understanding of what their business was than the carriers. That certainly has changed over the last several years. Uh, with the advent of uh, improved costing models, uh, with the advent of dimensionalizers, etc., the carriers now have a very good understanding of what the, the cost of doing business is with a particular shipper. Uh, and what that means is that they have a, a much better understanding of the cost drivers of handling that book of business and how it affects their profitability. Um, the good news is, is that as carriers understand that more and as shippers understand more the cost drivers that affect the cost of doing business with them, they can look at uh, their practices and processes and, and try to work strategically with their carriers to, to drive the cost down in those areas that are adversely affecting the relationship with the carriers. Carriers are very focused on operating ratios. They have hurdles they have to meet. Uh, the more they understand about a book of business from the technology uh, and, and the, the costing models that they're using today, the more th th they can understand what needs to be done to change the practices and drive the costs down. And by working strategically with your carriers, you can accomplish things uh, above and beyond uh, just trying to reduce your costs through freight savings. Okay, Vic, you know, that's, that sounds great and there are a lot of important information there. Let's unpack it, though. Because what I want to avoid is uh, perhaps since you and I live and eat and breathe in this space here, you know, I, I don't want to have, to have it be too much inside baseball, as it were. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for example, Darren Hawkins on one of the webinars that we hosted during our Perfect Storm series highlighted the fact that with ELDs, which are electronic logging devices, which are devices that go on trucks, uh, you know, and measure how the trucks are being used, the carriers can measure the time in minutes, not hours. So it's not just the length of time on the road, but what happens when they show up to your facilities or your suppliers or customers' facilities. And you also mentioned things with dimensionalizers. Uh, for some of those in the audience that may not be aware of what a dimensionalizer is, that's where we're snapping a picture and it provides the size and exact dimensions of the freight that's being put on the truck. And Darren was saying that, you know, we could, we now measure freight in inches and instead of, you know, feet and all. And so he said it's a big change. And one of the things I think you were alluding to is that today the table has turned from the perspective that the carrier in most instances has much better data about what's being put on their truck than the shippers. 
And so is that something that you're referring to? A absolutely, and I would concur with everything you're saying. Uh, when you talk about uh, measuring your business in, in minutes, that there's an old adage, time is money. And that's never more important than it is in the trucking industry today. Uh, a carrier you know, backs into a shipper's dock. Um, you know, they want to get in and they want to get out in a timely fashion because they need to get that truck rolling and, and, and moving and delivering freight and picking up freight. Um, to the extent that bills are lading already, uh, when the freight's there to be able to pick up, that's a positive thing. To the extent bills of lading are not ready or they're not legible, that's going to affect that time at the shipper's dock. That's going to be considered a negative from a carrier's perspective. Uh, to the extent, looking at cost drivers again, uh, a carrier coming in for one bill pickup, very costly. There's a fixed cost to move that truck into that uh, shipper's facility. Now to come in for one bill, there's a, a cost associated with that. To come in and pick up four or five bills at the same time, your cost per pickup per bill goes down. So it, it's important to keep those things in mind as a shipper as to what is affecting the cost of doing business with that carrier from my account. What can I do differently to help uh, the carrier reduce his cost of doing business and ultimately help me manage my cost more effectively uh, downstream. So one of the other things I just want to briefly share, for example, unpacking the operating ratio. And that's a, uh, a ratio which monitors a carrier's revenues that they derive from the business versus their cost. And if you have an operating ratio that's below 100, that means the carrier's making some money on your freight. If you have an operating ratio above 100, that means the carrier's losing money. So one of the things that you mentioned are cost drivers, and you gave us some examples, for example, a single shipment versus multiple shipments. And what happens when a carrier shows up is the bill of lading, is the freight ready to be you know, put on the truck, et cetera. Uh, one of the things we had talked about, Vic, as well, and something that you helped prepare was this managing from the inside out book that we put together in conjunction with helping companies build a transportation spend management plan. So can you elaborate on some other, you know, when you talk about practice and processes, that sounds great, but I'm sitting out here as a, a listener saying, well, what the heck do they mean? Can you give me some practical examples of the things that I'm doing within my organization that affect my consumption of freight and the rates that the carriers are charging? One thing that comes to mind, Mike, is, is a length of haul as a cost driver for the carriers to consider. Um, and, and it goes to really matching the right carrier with the right shipment. You, you don't want to use national-based carriers with regional freight. Um, that doesn't sit well within their, their footprint. It's not within their sweet spot. It's going to be a more costly type of shipment if you're giving uh, long-haul carriers short-haul freight and vice versa. Uh, can I interrupt for a moment? Just sure. I want to keep it real practical because, like I said, you and I live, eat, and breathe this stuff here. Okay. But, you know, average length of haul for a, a national carrier such as a UPS, uh, YRC, or an XPO, and a FedEx, et cetera, Old Dominion, that might be, for example, four to 500 miles versus a regional, which would be carriers, for example, like a Dayton or a Holland or people like that. And the average length of haul for that move might be 100 to 250, 100 to 300 miles. Is that kind of what you're talking about there? Exactly. Okay. So it's just making certain that you're using the right carrier for the right shipment. Uh, another factor that is very, very, very important today is, is density of freight. And that's, uh, that goes back to why they've spent thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on the dimensionalizer technology to understand what the density of the freight is uh, that ties into the classification of the freight. But more importantly is the utilization of their trailers. Um, their objective is to maximize the utilization of their equipment as part of their asset utilization uh, overall program. And so to the extent that you know, uh, shippers can positively impact the density of their freight through packaging changes, through you know, palletization and so forth, uh, that will have a positive impact on the cost structure for the carrier. Um, Handling of freight is another factor that, that really influences the cost of doing business with a carrier. Um, it's important for carriers to have an understanding of the number of handling units per shipment that, a, that a, a shipper will bring to them because the cost of handling a shipment that has two pallets is much different than handling the same shipment in terms of weight with five pallets. You've got five pallets to handle as opposed to two for the same 1,000 pounds, for example. So. Those are the type of things that shippers need to keep in mind that when they're looking at 
uh, what they can do from the inside out that will have a direct influence on the cost of doing business with their carriers, that those are the type of things that come to mind that they can look at and take a look at from the inside and see what can I do differently. The important thing is to walk in the carrier's shoes. They can make decisions based on uh, what they understand that will influence the cost of doing business with the carrier if they look at it from the cost uh, perspective from the uh, walking in the carrier's shoes. You know, Vic, this is, this is great stuff, and you mentioned walking in the shoes of the carriers, but one of the things, and I guess one of the reasons I get so amped up about this stuff is because I, I, I mentioned to this folks, and I mentioned this to folks, and they say, you know, Mike, that's great, but I just don't have the time. And so one of the problems we see is that when you use the traditional sourcing model that is largely influ influenced by procurement-based factors, it's, it's easy to overlook this. And they say, what difference does it make? So what I'd like to have you do is help those listeners out there that are saying, okay, Vic, you kind of got me intrigued. I may be willing to invest the time if I've got a suitable return. How much of a difference can this walking in the shoes approach make in terms of the rates that a carrier provides? I think it can make a huge difference. And, and the reason is that when the carriers will look at a, at a new book of business, um, they need to understand um, what is really involved in handling that book of business so they can put the information into their costing models and understand what they're getting into. They, they need to understand, you know, from a material handling perspective, length of haul perspective, freight class perspective, um, service requirements, etc., what's involved. To the extent that they can't get that information, to the extent that they need to get that information, a shipper's going to leave money on the table. There's no doubt in my mind. Uh, the, 2%, 5%, 10%? Well, I think it can vary on the, on the book of business, but it can be uh, upwards, of, of, upwards of 10%, I believe, if you don't provide the carriers the information they need. Because what a carrier is going to do is say, if I don't understand the business, I'm going to be risk aversive. Yep. To be risk aversive, I'm going to give less than maximized uh, pricing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give pricing that will leave money on the table for the shipper. Um, you know, it wasn't too many years ago that wouldn't be the case because the shippers didn't have, I mean, the carriers didn't have the ability to delve into that information to the extent they can today. But today the carriers understand exactly what they need and they're going to go after and get exactly what they need um, and it's going to be at the expense of higher prices if you can't give them what information that's going to help them make an informed decision. Can I maybe turn it around a little bit to put it like again, once again, like in, in terms that people may understand? The, the better the data, the less risk you're asking the carrier to assume. And that if you, that, you know, one of the reasons we spend so much time on the profiles and our proprietary sourcing initiatives, you know, that we conduct on behalf of shippers is because if we give them a great profile, we're not going to get what we call safety pricing. In other words, the carrier isn't saying, well, I could do this, but I'm going to hedge my bets and provide this instead. Is that kind of where you're headed with that? Absolutely. You know, I liken it to if you're, if you're building a house and you tell your, your, your architect or your contractor, I want four doors in my house. And three months pass and, and you haven't seen the house. You go three months later, you see the house and there's four doors across the front of your house. And you go to your architect and your builder and say, why are there four doors across the front of my house? That's ludicrous. Well, he says, that's all you told me. You told me you wanted four doors. You didn't tell me you wanted one in the front and one on each side and one in the back. And so I did the easiest thing possible with the information I had. I gave you four doors in the front of your house. That's not what you wanted. And that's sort of like what you're doing with the carriers. You're giving them a blueprint from which to propose a program for you. And to the extent that you can give them a profile that says, I want one door here and one door here and one door here and one door here, to the extent you can do that, you're going to get the kind of output or house or LTL program that you need. To the extent that you don't do that, you're going to end up shortchanged. You're going to get a program that's going to be risk aversive. You're going to get a program that's going to have less than desirable pricing because the carriers can't afford to do it any differently today. And they have the ability to do it in that fashion. It wasn't too many years ago where you, you could start shipping with a, a, a carrier and let's say for example you don't have an inside uh, delivery charge set up as an accessorial and the carrier says we're starting to handle inside deliveries and we don't have an accessorial set up to cover that. It wasn't too many years ago you could say to the carrier well let's wait and see how many inside deliveries there really are 
and they'd say, okay, we'll watch it. That doesn't happen anymore. A carrier saying, I can't afford to go one week handling inside deliveries without being compensated for it. And I have the technology to understand how frequently you have inside deliveries. So I'm going to say, we're going to go ahead and get an inside delivery charge today. The world has changed, and the advantage has gone from the shippers to the carriers. Vic, you're, you're providing a wealth of information, and, and I guess what this, hearing this kind of reminds me of the conversation that we've had with Rob Estes over the years. And for those of you that have not gone to the Transact website and downloaded a copy of that interview, I really encourage you to do. Because what Rob was talking about, he said, Mike, you know, here's, here's what a lot of people need to understand, the basics, if you will, of the LTL industry. An LTL truck, fully, you know, a good truck is 26 to 27,000 pounds. Mm -hmm. So it cubes out before it weighs out because you can put 42,000 pounds on a truck, but they don't have enough space in the LTL environment. So he said our strategy is real simple. Get the trucks as full as possible, and then once they're full, get rid of the least profitable freight if you can replace it with more profitable freight. And so what he was really talking about, he said, you know, and we've had this discussion with other carriers as well, Brad Jacobs, Mike Cronin from Dayton, and you know, uh, Darren Hawkins from YRC, Rob, et cetera, the list goes on and on. But what they were really highlighting is the fact that whereas three to five years ago or even before that, carriers were using a market-based pricing system where they wanted to have as much market share as possible. Mm -hmm. But one of the things some of these carriers have pointed out is, you know, market pricing doesn't necessarily mean profitable pricing. Right. And today with the cost of assets and everything else, we are profit-driven, asset utilization-based. Can you briefly just touch on that? Because I'm wondering, do shippers understand that important dynamic in the switch from market-based to profitability-based, asset utilization-based pricing? To answer that in a very short way, if, if shippers don't understand that, they, they need to. Uh, because it's become very, very obvious based on the investments the carriers have made over the last several years in technology, uh, in dimensionalizers, for example, uh, the pricing and costing models that they're, they're employing today, the, the focus has changed uh, significantly from that market-driven uh, application to a cost-driven application. Uh, to the extent that shippers can provide the carriers with the information they need to make informed decisions about that book of business, uh, they will ultimately benefit themselves. To the extent that they don't share that information, as we talked about a few moments ago, the carriers are going to be risk averse, risk aversive, and shippers will leave money on the table. There's, there's no doubt that that's going to take place. It's just uh, a reality of the marketplace today. So, five, ten percent, that type of thing. If I, I think it, at least that much. In some cases, it could be more than that. Absolutely. Okay. So, Vic, let's let's wrap it up. And so, some practical steps and tips for shippers. First of all, make sure that the profile you're putting together for your carriers is as accurate and complete as possible. Yes. Absolutely. Lane utilization, at, you know, matching up the freight where the carrier wants it, important? Absolutely. It's, you know, I liken it to uh, if you've got a problem with your eyes, I like these analogies, as you can maybe tell. But if you have a problem with your eyes, you, you don't go to a foot doctor. You go to an optometrist or an ophthalmologist for your eyes. And the same thing is true with the carrier selection. You, you don't want to go to, a, as I said, a long-haul carrier, a national carrier for regional freight and vice versa. You want to match it because there are sweet spots within their networks uh, that will return the kind of uh, uh, results the carrier is looking for. If you're not using the right carrier for the right freight, you're going to have less than an optimized solution. And just to underscore, Vic, you know, recently, uh, four or five months ago, a carrier walked in on a multi-million dollar book of business that they had and said, here's an increase, double-digit increase, you know, 14, 14 and a half percent. We said, you know, that's just not going to fly. And they said, here's what you can do. Eliminate three lanes, about 20 percent of the book of business, eliminate three lanes, and that 14, 14 and a half percent increase will drop down to 3%. Amazing. It's kind of counterintuitive because you would think that, well, if you pull business away from a carrier, it's not going to be to your benefit. But, you know, more of a bad thing is not a good thing. So to the extent that you can identify freight that doesn't fit well within a carrier's network, that's costing them a lot to serve, uh, and remove that and give it to a carrier where it does fit well into the network, and it does meet their operating requirements and their economic uh, objectives, you're going to benefit. Okay, one other thing here we touched on earlier. I just want to give a practical example. Density. Understand your density. Big? 
absolutely bigger today than it's ever been. Yeah, yeah. So Vic, you know, one of the other things we're seeing for people, uh, we've encouraged them really understand the accessorial issues that carriers incur in serving or attending to your book of business. Big deal? It's become, it's become a very big deal. I think the carriers have taken a page from the airlines and all the accessorials, if you will, the airlines charge their customers, where you see a, a very low uh, fare from point A to point B, then all the accessorials add up to it, and all of a sudden you've got a fare that's much different than you thought initially. The carriers basically are making certain that they're getting compensated for anything they do to handle a piece of freight. There's nothing wrong with that, but you need to understand that. You need to understand things that you might be able to uh, do in, in the past. Today, if you're asking a carrier to provide that service, you're going to pay for it. The best thing to do is understand uh, from your own particular book of business perspective, you as a shipper, what accessorial services you require from a carrier, yeah. and the order of magnitude. Now, if you have inside delivery or lift gates, do you have three a year? Do you have 3,000 a year? It makes a big difference as far as the cost implications and the, the wherewithal that you have to work with the carriers in handling that effectively. You know, just to underscore that, Vic, uh, one of our freight audit and payment customers came to us asking for help. You know, they know we're, we've done billions of dollars worth of sourcing events. And they said, you know, we've got a proposal here from the carrier. It looks pretty good on the surface because what they're doing is reducing our line haul rates by 3%. But they wanted to change the accessorial schedule. Can you help us understand the impact? And when, believe it or not, Vic, when we went and did the analysis, their freight costs would have gone up by as much as 7% based on the increased accessorial charges that the carrier wanted to provide. And the carrier's logic was this, is that the line haul is, you know, will be real competitive there. But those accessorial charges are critical because they represent costs we're incurring that we need to be compensated for. And like you said, it's not an issue anymore. Well, let's see how it plays out. The carriers know. And that's why I think, you know, we want to make sure everyone's aware of that. Uh, so, Vic, we, we've covered a lot of stuff. Is there anything that we've missed that you think people ought to be on the uh, alert for as they head into conducting sourcing strategies in 2020? Well, I think in addition to making certain that you really truly understand your business and what your business is comprised of so that you can effectively communicate that to the carrier so they understand it as well, I think it's equally important to, to as a shipper to walk in, in the carrier's shoes, to, to look at you know situations that you encounter from the carrier's perspective, understand how they would look at it. Um, I, I think it's important for shippers to, to look at working with carriers in a, in, a, in a strategic partnership environment as opposed to uh, the traditional way of doing business uh, that doesn't exist any longer in my opinion. Um, so make certain you're looking at it from that perspective. I think it'll be okay. Let me give you a practical tip to close out and maybe you could say, you know, preach it brother or amen or whatever, but you know, when you say walk in the carrier's shoes, when people come to me and talk to me about their sourcing events, and one of the major, major fallacies that I can tell them, you know, when they say, how can we get better? If it's a procurement sourcing event, one of the things they frequently overlook doing, which is why I encourage everybody, whether you use us or anybody else or do it internally, one of the things you need to do before you conduct your sourcing event, go to your carriers and ask them to share their operating ratio data. And a couple of years ago, you helped us prepare this great little white paper that's been read by you know, close to 5,000 people, where we have an example of an operating ratio worksheet in the booklet. When we talked about how you can, you know, get, you know, conduct world-class LTL sourcing initiatives, we have that. Is that kind of like a great tip for helping them walk in the carrier shoes, look at the operating ratio data before you start your sourcing event? Absolutely. And I think some carriers might be reluctant to share that operating ratio information with you. But if you explain to them why you you want that information Bingo. and what you're going to do with it and how you're going to look at that information in terms of crafting a business opportunity for them that makes sense for them both economically and operationally, then I think you'll get more cooperation from the carriers as opposed to saying, I just want to know how much money you're making on my business. You know, and, and Vic, I just want to, I just feel so passionate. We're running a little bit over and I appreciate your time. But one of the reasons we encourage people to do just that is because the practices we're trying to identify in the operating ratio are what we call agnostic. It's not carrier specific. If you're t giving a carrier one package or two package versus five packages, you're not just giving it to carrier A or carrier B, you're giving it across the carrier base usually. And that's what we want to do and that's why we encourage people when they put those 
profiles together, if we can get the operating ratio data, it will identify some practices that we can give the carriers information about so that they can make an informed pricing decision, no safety pricing, give us actual, this is what it's going to cost to do business with us, right. and you've got the best possible rate. Is that kind of an accurate but prolonged summary? I agree 100%. Okay. Hey, Vic, thanks for your time. And for those of you that want more information, we encourage you to go to transact.com. Uh, whether it's in the Perfect Storm Center or if you have information that you just want to call and ask about, we'd welcome the opportunity to continue this dialogue about how you can get the best possible LTL rates in the marketplace. Thanks for your time.